uh, comes from James. James has already won a smart speaker before because, he says, son of the team, I am the lowly BBC journalist James who used to add ridiculous facts to my CFAX pages. Oh, oh yes. that was a good one. Catch out other local radio stations who would just copy my words and read them out in their news bulletins. You remember there was it the Nine Stone Dog? Nineteen Stone <laughs> Dog. Nineteen Stone yeah. Dog and the, the 400-metre long tree. Yeah. <laughs> Which would have been something else. Anyway, it's him. Well, I went on to have a very successful career at the BBC as a TV producer. Before I was ruthlessly phased out, my access passed being cancelled on my last day before I'd even left the building. Mm. Sound familiar, Simon? Yeah. Yeah, it does, actually. Anyway, as a producer, it was my job to make cutting-edge documentaries, finding new stories with great, great contributors, and make waves in the news with my edgy journalism. It was high-octane stuff. There were a few important rules when filming material for a documentary. Number one was never have a poo in a contributor's house. <laughs> Agreed. It was deemed the height of bad manners. Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid I never stuck to that rule. As I said, it was a stressful job. Okay. Number two, as it were, was don't get contributors drunk. This might seem be seen as a bribing kind of affair or buttering them up to change or exaggerate their story. Anyway, they were the rules. Not yeah, different. okay. Weeks and weeks <laughs> of research had led me to film this particular story in a town, which I'm just going to say is in the western half of the UK. There you go. Mm. A tale of local miscreants making life for locals miserable and criminal gangs being criminal. I had made contact with various lads, including one criminal, to meet us at this particular day of filming. The criminal was very hard to pin down and very unreliable. Well, <laughs> which, good thought. Which, which they tend to be. But he was important to my story. So I thought it was a good idea to tell him to meet us at the local working men's club. I told him to buy a sandwich and a drink and wait for us. And I called the club and told them to set up a tab and I'll play later. As this was a crucial uh, part of my documentary, the presenter had to come and do interviews and appear like she was actually involved in the story, which she really wasn't. This presenter was extremely posh and not really from the world that I'd become immersed in. So, rather typically, this very posh presenter arrived on the day of filming in a totally inappropriate blacked-out limo, immaculately <laughs> dressed and two hours late. Oh. She was clearly out of her comfort zone in a small town where we were in the western half of the United Kingdom, a million miles from posh North London. I enjoyed her discomfort, Father Simon. <laughs> anyway, she said about interviewing locals in a hopelessly out-of-touch way, not quite, golly, how poor are you exactly, but that kind of wow. thing. <laughs> Anyway, we were running late, so I texted the waiting criminal at the working men's club, and he replied saying it was fine and we should take as long as we wanted. Alarm bells should have gone off there and then. After filming our pieces to camera, we rocked up to the working men's club on this Tuesday afternoon, three hours late, me, the cameraman, the sound man, and the very posh presenter to find it absolutely packed to the rafters with locals. Word had got out that the BBC was in town <laughs> and, and that we had set up a tab behind the bar <laughs> and it was officially party time. Farmers had left their fields, <laughs> mechanics had shut their garages, builders down tools oh, and they all headed for the club. Everyone was completely drunk. The moment they saw us, they looked in amazement at this famous BBC presenter standing in the doorway. The crowd cheered and surged forward, smelly and dirty, having come straight from work, and mobbed my very posh presenter, kissing her, hugging her, shaking her hand, getting up close, selfies the lot. It was all good-humoured and fun, but not for my immaculately dressed presenter. She was not pleased, to say the least, but I stood back and enjoyed this hearty welcome. They all wanted to say hello, that's all. My heart sank when I found out the criminal I had arranged to meet there had texted everyone to get to the club sharpish as the BBC had set up a tab and told everyone it was free drinks all round. That was certainly not the arrangement. Needless to say, filming was cancelled. The very posh presenter jumped into the limo, sped down the M4 quicker than I could say, or pay even, the massive bar bill, which was more than £1,000. Goodness me. So, Simon, I wanted to say sorry for a number of things, as you might imagine. Sorry for wasting the licence fee in such a way, but what a party they all had. Well, yes, <laughs> indeed. As you can imagine. OK. And sorry to my presenter, who got covered in a lot of drool and slobber. No doubt her dry-cleaning bill was as big as the bar bill, 
I learned a valuable lesson on that day, which was don't trust criminals, which you would have thought <laughs> no, no, is a yeah. very yeah. useful life lesson. Yeah. James, thank you very much. I don't know if we're going to give you another spa speaker, but anyway, um, <laughs> Sister Jackie, what do you say to James this time? Uh, well, well I, I certainly don't forgive his naivete as a as a reporter to set up a bar bill at a tab for a known criminal and ask him to just have a, you know, a, a sherry and a sandwich while yes. while you waited to turn up three hours late. So that's a bit daft, a bit unforgivable. But I do appreciate these stories and I hope they keep coming. I do too. I think there's more where these came from. <laughs> uh, brother from another guy. I mean, actually, if we dig into this story, surely it's the presenter that's the problem here. If she'd bothered to turn up on time, then nobody would have been drinking up on the bar bill, would they? If she'd got there when she was supposed to be there, then they wouldn't have spent three hours running up that bill with uh, with your booze and your and your cigarettes and your, and your sandwiches. So, uh, so really, it's all her fault. And if she wanted to do a documentary where she's stepping on the seamier side of life, then you got it, didn't you? In bucket loads with everyone <laughs> slobbering all over you. Very coutured clothing. Keep going. I'm still going, <laughs> apparently. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to forgive, obviously.